I'd like to explore in more detail in this video an approximation I alluded to in the last one, and that is the local spin density approximation when implemented in cone sham theory. And that'll help us understand how modern density functionals uh, work and how they're employed. So uh, let's just review very briefly here that the exchange correlation energy is the difference between the classical and the quantum mechanical electron-electron repulsion. It also includes the difference in kinetic energy between a fictitious non-interacting cone sham system and a real system. And I'll note that most functionals don't attempt actually to compute that kinetic energy correction explicitly. And that they either just ignore that term or they construct a whole function similar to that of equation five uh, in an earlier lecture that somehow incorporates the kinetic energy difference between interacting and non-interacting systems, maybe empirically. And if it's not exactly clear to you how you would go about determining this difference in kinetic energy, that's good, actually, because it's, it's pretty hard. In fact, just the very idea of how you get kinetic energy out of a density is not at all obvious, and uh, this continues to be an area where people are trying to make new developments in density functional theory to deal with the kinetic energy term. But in many uh, functionals that are used for the exchange correlation piece, some empirical parameters may be introduced uh, in order to improve performance. And so I want to say a little bit about notation. And so the the dependence of the exchange correlation energy on rho is, uh, is what makes it a functional. And in general, one gets this by integrating over all space the interaction of the density with an energy density that's itself dependent on the electron density. So you've got this exchange correlation piece here that also depends on the density. And this density can be treated either as a, well, it is a sum, whether it be separable easily or not, of the exchange and correlation contributions. And so, for instance, we've looked at the exchange energy expression associated with Slater or Dirac of uh, using a rho, in this case, to the one-third power because it's the, it's the energy density, uh, and these were a bunch of constants that appear, and here's this alpha value. So when it's Slater, this would be one. When it's Dirac, this would be two-thirds. Or you could just treat it as an empirical tunable parameter, and that would be what you would plug in to that integral. So you, you know what rho is, and otherwise it's just a bunch of constants. Now, in the field, you often uh, express the electron density not uh, necessarily directly, but by talking about an effective radius. And so this effective radius r is the radius that you would have to go out given a particular density in order to encompass one electron total worth of density. So this is just 4 pi r cubed, uh, sort of in 4 thirds pi r, r cubed, that is uh, inverted in such a way that you're solving for r, and so you got a 1 third power. So just you can verify for yourself this is just the spherical equation that would give you one electron's worth of density. So this would be a characteristic radius associated with a given density. Now up till now we've not considered spin. Uh, we've been speaking pretty generically about electron density. If you do want to deal with spin then you can have separate functionals for the alpha and the beta densities. And again, notationally in the field, people will refer to the spin polarization and indeed the normalized spin polarization. And that uh, spin polarization zeta is the difference between the alpha and beta spin densities divided by the net density. So that as the normalization, if you like. So alpha spin density is one half the product of the total density and zeta plus one. That would be a way to compute it beta spin density is the difference. So I'll let you do that rather simple algebra for yourself if you'd like to, but uh, that is how we can express the separate alpha and beta densities. So what is LDA, the local density approximation? It's any density functional theory where the value of the exchange correlation energy density at a given position R is computed exclusively from the value of the density at that position. So it is a local property. It depends on the local value of the density. 
Most of these functionals are derived from considerations of the uniform electron gas. All right, because in the uniform electron gas, we actually can compute these things exactly for this fictitious system. You can do exchange exactly. So LDA implies its uniform electron, usually implies anyway, that it's uniform electron gas exchange and correlation functionals being used in a molecular calculation. That is, you take the exchange energy density you know is correct for a uniform electron gas, and you assume that it will be correct at each given position within a molecule. Now, of course, a molecule is not a uniform electron gas. It has different values of the density throughout space. But what you're assuming is whatever the density is in the molecule, whatever value it takes on, the local exchange energy density would be the same as for an, a uniform electron gas having that same density as is found at that position in the molecule. So of course it changes throughout the molecule, but there's that relationship. Now if you'd like to extend to the spin polarized case that considers both alpha and B, uh, sorry, alpha and beta spins, then you can actually take this exchange energy density, which used to depend on density, now it depends on electron density and spin polarization, and this expression here, which looks you know, mildly painful, but uh, essentially is a combination of the spin-free exchange energy density and then a separate term that adds on an additional effect depending on the spin polarization. And so note that if zeta were to be equal to zero, so that's no spin polarization, remember, you get one to the four thirds plus one to the four thirds, so that's one plus one is two minus two, so this whole thing would be zero. And so sure enough, this has the right limit that if there is no spin polarization, you just get back the spin free case. Now, what about the correlation? So I've, I've been talking about exchange up till now. Well, even for the uniform electron gas, you can't simply analytically derive what that functional should look like. However, in 1980, Sepperly and Alder did some quantum Monte Carlo calculations, and I've alluded to those, although I haven't provided much detail about how you do those things, uh, in order to compute the total energy of fully interacting uniform electron gases of various densities. So they got the correct energy, and then people subtracted from that energy the analytical exchange energy, which we've just been talking about up till now, and so anything left over is the correlation energy. And they then designed local functionals of the density by fitting to those results that would give the best possible values. Va sorry, not they, but Vasco, Wilk, and Nusser used the data from Sepperly and Alder to create local correlation functionals that best fit uh, the original quantum Monte Carlo results. They also can be spin polarized or spin free uh, and they follow an exactly similar approach. Now I haven't actually got an example of one of these local functionals because they're quite ugly to write down. They're not, they're not pretty, they're fitting, they're splined, but uh, you know, once they're coded in a digital computer, they are still pretty simple. It's local. You're just going to compute a certain value at a certain position in space, multiply it times the density at that position in space, and move on to the next position as you solve your integral. The Vosco-Wilkes-Nusser fitting is uh, often represented by VWN, the, uh, the initials for the names of the authors, and they had several schemes they employed and so if you do see one of these uh, correlation functionals in the literature, it might have a number after it. So VWN3, VWN5, meaning in the paper where they originally described it, which fitting scheme was used. There are some, this says empirical constants. That's a little perhaps unfair to call it empirical. Rather, it's a empirical to the extent you have to pick some form for fitting. But usually we don't call that empiricism. We just call that mathematical convenience. But they did have different ways of doing it. So when you combine Slater exchange and VWN correlation, you might call that density functional combination SVWN. So S for Slater and VWN. So that's an example of a local spin density approximation. Now, you, you can, in fact, use empirically optimized constants. Remember that the Slater form has this alpha value that can be played around with. And as we move to later functionals, we'll see that you can introduce more constants. 
And there's a choice of functional form. That's really what underlies the VWN fitting to the correlation energy, choosing some functional form. Incidentally, these integrals that we've been talking about, while they're local, they are not necessarily simple in, in the sense that they allow an analytic solution. Instead, you really do have to solve these integrals numerically, typically on a grid, and so people have done a lot of work in picking what are the most efficient grids to give the highest level of accuracy for the least computational cost. And so solving integrals on grids involves uh, quadratures, that's sometimes called, so quadrature schemes play a role. Uh, in a modern code, there is typically some default grid that's get, that gets used, unless it's otherwise specified by the user. So in our case, we are uh, going to be using the quantum chemistry code Gaussian09 in class, and there there's a keyword, integral, parenthesis, grid equals ultrafine, close parenthesis, that'll be recommended in all the problem sets to try to get well-converged values for some of these integrals. So what happens in the Cohn-Sham self-consistent field procedure? Well, remember in Hartree-Fock theory, a bottleneck is that the number of Coulomb and exchange integrals that we have to evaluate scales as n to the fourth, where n is the number of basis functions. Now, in density functional theory, it turns out that we can reduce this formal scaling to n cubed, where n is the number of Cohn-Sham atomic orbital basis functions, effectively. And the reason we can do that is the density with which we interact does not actually have to be expressed in the same basis functions that are being used to form the molecular orbitals. Instead, you can have an auxiliary basis set, just a standalone basis set, that's used to build the density. And then when you compute interactions of orbitals with the density, you use that auxiliary basis. It may not be obvious that that'll be a time savings, but it does reduce the scaling because you're not taking your density as a product you're taking it just with its own basis functions. Of course, you probably need more of them since you are constructing it all out of one set of functions, but, okay, that's a technical point. I don't want to dwell too much, but it does cause DFT to scale more favorably than Hartree-Fock theory. And that's a pretty remarkable thing because DFT has included within it electron correlation. So it's already got something beyond Hartree-Fock, and yet it scales better than Hartree-Fock, and that's a reason that DFT is a, a real go-to theory in the 21st century. Okay, but in any case, once you've chosen a basis set and a molecular geometry, then things go much like in Hartree-Fock theory. We compute overlap integrals, we compute kinetic energy integrals, we compute nuclear attraction integrals, that's all the same, Hartree-Fock and DFT. Now, in Hartree-Fock, we would construct a density matrix and then compute two electron integrals, in DFT, we construct a density matrix, and we also construct the exchange correlation potential. Uh, we add the remaining integrals then into the Cohn-Sham matrix elements, and after this point, again, we're sort of identical. We cycle through until orbitals are converged. So those new orbitals come from each solution of the secular equation. We get density out of those orbitals. We compare it with the density of the previous integration, sorry, iteration, and when it's converged, we compute the energy a little bit differently. In Hartree-Fock theory, we would now have a many electron wave function and we would evaluate the Hamiltonian. In density functional theory, we take our final density and we plug it in to the energy expression that appeared uh, in a prior video in equation 14. And that's the expression that just says, what is the dependence on density? We've got a density, we plug it in. So uh, again, there's that comparison one is expectation value of h, and one is uh, an actual equation involving density. Of course, we can geometry optimize, we can compute gradients, and uh, I'll, I, I've said this in words a little earlier, but I'll say it again. Using the LSDA approximation means we pretend, or approximate, I suppose, that the exchange correlation energy density at every position in space for a molecule is the same as it would be for a uniform electron gas having the same density as is found at that position in the molecule. Of course, it varies through the molecule, and so we'll be using different UEG gas results everywhere we go in the molecule. Well, all right, how do these things do? We've spent a long time talking about putting it together and the mechanics and the technical details, but how does it do? Well, in his Nobel lecture in 1998, Walter Cohn noted that the local spin density approximation, the one we've discussed up till now, when used to optimize molecular geometries, gives bond lengths, and hence geometries, of molecules and solids 
typically to an astonishing accuracy of about 1%. And indeed, that is a, you know, that's a pretty good accuracy, one would have to say, for, uh, for geometries. However, if we look at energies, there are still reasonably severe errors for uh, the local spin density approximation. So in, in future lectures, uh, I'm going to present results that are sort of representative over large databases, reasonable basis sets. You would have to go to benchmarking papers to study all the details. But uh, here, let's just look at one set of bond energies and barrier heights. And these are mean unsigned errors in kilocalories per mole. And let's sort of compare LSDA to what might have been a reasonable comparison, a theory that actually takes a little longer as molecules get bigger because the scaling behavior is bad. So Hartree-Fock theory, a mean unsigned error in bond energies on some large, uh, large test set is 31 kcals per mole, so that's pretty awful. And the mean unsigned error in barrier heights, 9 kcals per mole for some representative set of reactions. On those same uh, bond separation energies and reactions data set, LSDA reduces the error in bond energies by a factor of two. Uh, so that's certainly a, a non-trivial reduction, but 16 kcals per mole error is still pretty large. And it increases the error in barrier heights by a factor of two. So, so far, it's not that LSDA has blown away the field, but given that it's faster and it formally includes some electron correlation, and it's not really doing a whole lot worse, it certainly seems like it is a good foundation upon which to uh, build and continue to explore functional development. So in the next video, we'll look at the step taken after LSDA, which leads to considerably improved performance.